intentionally planted, just like when Obama says something like, we have airplanes that land on a carrier and we have boats that go under. So that it can be a sound bite that can be 10 seconds played on the news the next day so that the person looks like a fuddy-duddy, outdated, archaic, white, rich guy running for the other party looks like an idiot. That has no potency. In my class, I go, that's a fallacy of evidence suppression and ridicule and condescension and bullying. But it works. And it works very powerfully. As a matter of fact, it worked so much so that the next day, 45,000 headlines on Facebook read, he sure showed Mitt Romney what the hell really the Marines do. How? Airplanes land on carriers. OK, yeah, he did totally educate us. You're right. Makes sense. And while you get the dripping sarcasm, the closer I come to the most recent elections, you're going with, oh, but you have a bias. No, I'm telling you what the speechwriters advised the presidential candidates to do and what the element of politics is. And if a person talks to you in this classroom, I want you to call them out on bluff. And so that means as a student in this class, you're going at the very end of their speech, it gets to the Q&A, where you're going, I'm sorry, in the introduction, introduction, and you can look at, where does it say in your book are the fallacies? Page 156, let's go. Let's have a look. This is what I'm going to hold you accountable for. Every class that you ever come when your colleagues are holding speeches. When your colleagues say, we're all excited that the San Francisco Giants won the national title. It's awesome. And not for the first time, but two times in a row. Giants! Uh, bandwagon fellas. Is anybody in this room that doesn't agree with the Giants being the best thing since sliced bread? Probably yes. So you can't go with we all agree. You might go, okay, when the city of San Francisco had a most recent gathering with the largest crowd ever to support a Major League Baseball team, and here are the statistics. When the Anaheim Angels won, they are only ranked in the 15th biggest crowd in Los Angeles. So you might be sitting there going, oh, I kind of have to agree with you. Not that I agree with what you're saying, but I can see with how you're justifying it. And the thing is that the moment you have to go, here's my source and here's my, you can see how that's boring and lame and uh, outdrawn. So that's why people go and use pathos to supplement with that. And the moment you bring pathos up, you're using fallacies. As we had as an example, let's go and look down the path of if a person says, well, you either vote Democrat or you vote Republican. That's not true. You have a couple of choices. You could vote Libertarian, Green Party, leave the country. Choices. But either or is it's cut and dry. No, it's not. Why do we have a bipartisan system? Why don't we have more parties? Why don't we emulate what the British say? I don't know. Sounds like too hard. But as we go down this path, and you look at the different things, the person says, hi, you're a student, you're a college student. Is it possible that you could be up at, let's say, 3 a.m. watching TV? Because you've been studying hard, you're not pulling an all-nighter, but you're still up. Actually, you were trying to lay back down, but then you got up. You just did a distraction. And then there's an infomercial that says, hi, would you like these poor children in Africa to die? None of us are going to, yes, die. <laughs> Let's go back. Die. Okay. None of us do that because it's called an appeal to fear where you're going, would you like these children to die? Because by incident, and by the way, you might be sleep withdrawn, and if you're in Colorado, you might also have smoked pot and go, oh, yeah, I'll give them money. And by the way, by definition, the state of Colorado just legalized it. However, depending on the threshold of the class, some of you might be going, oh, funny, Mel, that's hilarious. And some of you go, oh, I'm offended by that. I don't think that was the right thing to say. Notice the threshold. The state of Colorado passed it. In fact, the luxury of being able to be pot smoking is not yet legal because it's not implemented yet. So it's just a condescending remark, which is something called an appeal to misplaced authority. I'm not an expert on telling you on how many students are smoking pot, and I just did it for the effect of a bandwagon fallacy of having students go, ha, that's freaking hilarious. Where I may have also alienated people going, I don't agree with that. And thanks for stereotyping me as a pot smoking idiot that's up at 3 o'clock in the morning watching a person that's going to go and get my money because I'd rather donate at the local soup kitchen, and that's how I am, but the majority of students might not relate to that, but it just pissed me off. depends on who's listening. And what I want you to be aware of in this classroom is you're twofold empowered. If you're in the audience and you're going, I'm sorry, I think you just uh, did something called, which is one of my favorite, appeal to misplaced authority, where you claimed all this stuff, which is basically most of the time when a student forgets to reference a source, and you call them out on it, and you go, well, I feel like, it's can you actually name a source that made that statement? And the person's going, I, yeah, no, uh, you caught me. Um, moving on. <coughs> what happens to your credibility? 
And so how do I set this up that it's fair for the classmates to feel like I'm calling them out with the best possible question, but I'm not screwing them over so that they're not getting an F? How do I do that? And what's the whole purpose, by the way, Neil? And I'm going to go and go and do, do three approaches. Is it fair that during the course of this class, I've established that my students, A, can trust me, and B, I'm not out to get you, and C, that my number one intent is for my students to kick ass, get the grade that they deserve, and succeed, not fail? Is that a fair statement? So, instead of saying, trust me, I've shown that in preface of, pre of record. Is that a yes or a no? So the translation is not that on our final assignment, on assignment number five, I want to sit back there and go, look at that person square it, not knowing the answer. Look at them fail. Oh, it's so enjoyable. They're totally, they're just, they're just, oh, this is great. Oh my god. That would undermine everything we've done in the class up until now. So how is this set up? How is it supposed to be that the person is just saying, going, um, I'm, and the word little nervous is the understatement of the day. Um, freaking out that I'm going to have to do a speech where I'm doing my best possible job while also dealing with other classes and then get to the point where somebody drills into me on questions and I'm going with, I don't know the answer and I'm getting an F and they actually get a good grade for it. Male, how is that fair? Let me explain. What do we do as human beings when somebody has spoken for seven, maybe even ten minutes and they're presumably an expert on the topic? And then they get a question. Let's say it even would be an instructor. You absolutely expect they would know the answer. Like, what's the definition of communication? Do you think I should know the answer to that? You do too. <laughs> but, but if I were to go with, uh, I don't know what that is. OK, that's problematic. But let's say you have a question that's a little bit more in depth. And the person that you absolutely expect to be an expert, a classmate that done, has done a topic, they don't know the answer to it. What do we do as human beings' first gut instinct when we don't know the answer to something and we believe the other person should and we have a little degree of shame and pride on the line? What do we do? We bullshit an answer. We lie. And as a matter of fact, some people get super comfortable. It's really interesting when you have a person go, okay, um, in your introduction you researched that it states that all bag in California, what source do you have for that? Well, that's a really good question. In my back of my mind, I know I have no freaking idea how to answer that, but I just get super comfortable to go off on a tension that has nothing to do with what you just asked me. And uh, while I elaborate on this, by the way, I'm getting so comfortable that I'm like, notorious life. I'm actually much more at ease when I'm bullshitting because that's my general modem of operation. Um, actually saying, hey, this is, and so I'm going to go off on a tension that has nothing to do with it and let's move on. By the way, look at politicians. They're really great at that. Or the, I know you just asked me how I'm going to go and do that. Let me go and talk, totally ignore what you just said. And uh, while I know it's the most important thing in your life, I'd like to go over here on this tension that has nothing to do with this, but when I'm all done, I feel really good about myself. All right, excellent. Let's get back to what I didn't cover. Any other questions? So as you go down this, have you seen this? Have you seen this recently? And by the way, including either one of those candidates or any of the 12 that last time <coughs> for the Republican Party or in the history of any politician ever running for office because... That's human. How would you like to have every single thing that you breathe, live, and do every single day of your life being scrutinized and then nationally media? Say, yeah, that's, that's a little intimidating. Nobody can be that perfect. I'm, I've never done anything wrong. I do everything perfect. And by the way, I'm God. Ask me anything. Not happening. But we are hypocritical in assuming that that person should be flawless. So how do I set it up that the person can actually say, Edgar, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. That's a really good question. I'll get back to you on that. Um, Ellen, man, that's a tough question. Jerk. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. You should have the right and the integrity to be able to say that with the two following components. Your classmates not actually getting a kick out of embarrassing you, but permitting you the ability to fix the hole that you left open in your speech and have the ability to say, Costa, that's a really good question. I don't know, but I'll get back to you. And then have until midnight to fix via email addressed to the entire class at large the answer that you didn't have. Which means, let's say, Emily, if I say to you, I didn't know the answer, I'm sorry. But the next morning, you look in your inbox and you see that the person definitely worked very hard because you know from the moment that you actually had them leave the class until that moment they have graphics, they have a reference, and you go, all right, they followed up with the question that I asked. Uh, what was your perception on their credibility, going up or down? Absolutely. That's what I want in this classroom, where you actually ask such potent questions where you go, well, I'm actually kind of glad you asked me this, but there's a big difference between you going, Rick, I, I don't know. I'll get back to you, buddy. Hey, Nicole. I don't know. I know. Dylan, hey, dumb question. If you do that four or five times, there's a difference between being prepared or having a second chance. 
I'm a firm believer in second chances. Is it also fair that I've established that in this classroom? So the ca category for me is that as a student, you should have the ability to say, I don't know. But if you go and Amanda, I mean, that's literally if you go and, oh yeah, I'll get back to you. And then if Amanda looks at the next morning in her inbox and says, I don't think Amanda will go at 6, at 7, at 8, how about now, how about now, how about now, I want to know my answer, how about now, I want to know. I don't think you will do that, ma'am, because you have another life that's also going on. But let's say you woke up and there's nothing. That's the equivalent of you going, yeah, I don't care, Amanda. And I believe that you didn't enjoy me just flicking you off. Is that a fair statement, ma'am? But that's technically what your colleague just did by saying, I don't care. I'm just adhering to mail because he makes me do this. Uh, no, let me be very clear. I want you to have a chance to not get an F. I want you to have a chance to genuinely say in a Q&A, I don't know. I want you to technically have the ability to go, Nicole, that's a great question. In my research, it states, uh, I can either address the first part of the second question or the second part. And I have actually a graphic that addresses the question. That's what I want. That would be fantastic. That's the moment where you're going, yes. I get to finally show how hard I work. This is awesome. But what I don't want is when you basically go and do this. Uh, gee, Katie, that was a very surprising question I did not see coming. With the three slides that I prepared, I will be answering the question that shocked me and amazed me because I was <laughs> shivering in my boots when you were asking me this question. You get what just happened, right? Don't plant a colleague to ask a question. If you're that good, then write a better speech. It takes a crook to know a crook. I could get away with something. Why that would not? It's not the purpose of the Q&A. Purpose of the Q&A is got that question. Check. Okay, good. Thanks. Good rehearsal. Love it. Uh, Nathan. <laughs> Nathan, don't you have a question, sir? Uh, you don't? <laughs> Why is Mail raising his hand? Um, <laughs> your speech is supposed to be between a certain time frame. Let me be very clear. You want to be as close to 7 as possible. Your time comes in at 4.30. I will be asking you the first three questions for which you do not know the answer. Let me clarify why. If you literally felt, um, I could come in at 4.30, so Mail, give me your best shot. You will not know the answer to this. And by the way, I'm not intending to screw you over. Who do I want to hear questions from? The students that are getting the grade for identifying fallacies. I don't want to talk. I've researched your topics. Which also means the reason I'm researching them is not to screw you over, but if you're done, and you're sitting back down, you know you're anxious and nervous. And as you're sitting back down, I'm responsible to go, okay, class collectively, here is, uh, let's say Annabelle was the one that had the, the speech, she's sitting back down, and I believe Annabelle would appreciate it if I go, here's what you will be expected to follow up. And you go, okay, cool, I'm gonna write this down. And just to clarify, this is what you can research, and that's reasonable, as opposed to what your colleague initially asked you, which means you'll be spending four weeks on that answer. By the way, the answer to that is, but Annabelle will be following up on. That's why I'm researching your topic. And Annabelle will go, cool, makes sense, and you know what exactly to look for when you look in your inbox to what the follow-up should be. I'm not saying here is exactly where to look, but what the frame of the question is, so the person can say, that makes sense. By the way, sometimes I will go, um, Austin, was your question addressing the research? And Austin might go, that wasn't exactly my question. Oh, yes, yes it was. <clears throat> I would like to have an answer to that question. You get the gist on why that might be helpful for the person to follow up with? So I'm not intending to screw a, a student or a classmate over, but if I frame it in such a way that makes the student be empowered and the person to actually not go, I think mainly went a little bit off the deep end, which sometimes I might frame the question so potently that the person's going, that's not at all my question. <laughs> that's fine. But if I'm going, Sir, is that what you asked? I don't want you to go, sure, follow up with it. If you don't care, then don't ask it in the first place. Don't just bring up a question for the sake of, I have a grade. You want to make sure you ask stuff to empower your colleague and stuff that makes them better, but also the things that you care about. That's the purpose. So in a direct rerun of reputational reasoning, don't just tell your audience what you believe in and indoctrinate your views. Avoid self-evident truth. The only time self-evidence is permittable is if you're going, I'm going to kick ass in this speech, and then you will. It's the only time you can use self-evidence, but not for the purpose of the type of reasoning. Fallacies is, by definition, something is missing. And by the way, if you're an archie student at this campus, don't tell them that they're an architect, and when you get punched out, you call me and go, that's true, they are that defensive, because you know what they're responsible for? Structural integrity. You know what architect uh, architects are responsible for? It being possibly pretty. Nice way to paraphrase that, right, ma'am? But by definition, what I want you to be concerned about is structural integrity of your reasoning first, then make it pretty. But don't make a building that has fantastic pillars, but looks like the Acropolis. Meaning Athens has nice pillars still standing, but the rest of the building is gone. 
There's such a thing as a structurally extremely sound building. You know what they're called? Bunkers. They're really ugly, but they can withstand a nuclear bomb attack. Kennedy Library. <laughs> it's not a segue. It's kind of like one of the ugliest buildings we have on an architecturally high campus. It's not pretty, but I'm pretty sure in an earthquake we'd be solid. However, Hearst Castle withstood a 6.7 earthquake by a female architect. Is that a fair statement, ma'am? So by definition, it's pretty and it's potent. But don't try to build a Hearst Castle, which took the entire duration of its owner and him being dead and him rebuilding the pool four, five, six times. Built a Kennedy Library, and if it can look a little bit like Hearst Castle, we're doing great, especially in a 101 class. If you're in a 126, Start building one of the towers of Hearst Castle. If you're graduating in your comms, you build the next Hearst Castle. And it looks like Schwanstein and better. And by the way, the reference is to the Disney Castle if you don't have that component on global travel to the German castle. But for the time being, build a bunker for your persuasive speeches. And notice how I closed our entire class with Hitler bad, build a bunker. <laughs> <laughs> have a good, productive, enjoyable, but then very productive long weekend ahead. Bye. Somebody be nice enough like turning off the people. It's not recording. Come back, Tyler. <laughs>